world, um, to give us life and life more abundantly, to set us free. Uh, God has a plan for our lives, but the devil also has a plan for our lives. He came into the world to kill, steal, and destroy, to bind us up in generational bondages of fear, mental disorders, infirmities, etc., etc., on to keep us bound from receiving Jesus as our Lord and Savior, and to keep us from serving God's people. Um, at age five years old, I remember asking my mom questions about God. I was very interested about God. Um, she told me Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He was the Savior of the world. Uh, we need to believe in God. But I never heard um, the words about being born again. Uh, repent of your sins. Um, at five years old, I had my first supernatural experience with God. Um, I loved to swing in my swing, and I was swinging in my swing in the front yard. It was an overcast day, and I was singing my heart out. And um, I said, God, if you're really real, you know, reveal yourself to me. Uh, change the weather in front of me. <laughs> so it was overcast outside, so God did a vision. So it was like a panoramic panoramic vision around me, and I saw sunshine before me, I saw rain before me, I saw snow before me, um, but I didn't get wet. It was in a vision, but I was so excited. I remember um, jumping out of my swing and running to the house and saying, Mom, you know, God did all these things for He showed me He's real, and so that was 50 years ago, and I remember it like it was the other day, and so, you know, God really did this to reveal Himself to me. And I thank him for that. Um, as a preschooler, I had a spirit of confusion on me. I couldn't follow directions. I didn't know how to socialize. Um, my parents were teachers, so they thought I had like high functioning autism. Um, I had a strong, a very stronghold of fear on me, which they called back then a mental block. Um, when I was in elementary school, I had a difficult time socializing with kids. Um, I'd be playing on the playground by myself in my own little world. Um, the playground bell would go off, and the kids were back in class, and yet there I was in my own little world. Um, and the playground teacher would have to come and get me and bring me in. <laughs> uh, I daydreamed in class. I got behind in my assignments in elementary school. I had terrible, awful migraines in elementary school up until adult age. Um, I had my church pray over me, and the Lord delivered me from that infir infirmity of migraine headaches. Praise the Lord, most high God. I was miraculously healed on the spot from that migraine headaches. Praise God. By the time I was in junior high, I wanted to uh, get good grades. Um, I forced myself to study for hours, and actually one time got straight A's. I ended up graduating with a 3.68 grade average. So God was really, even before I was saved, he was there for me. Praise the Lord. So I was an honor student when I graduated from high school. It's all the praise and glory of God. My parents were functioning alcoholics. They worked all day teaching, and when they came home from work, they drank all night. They were very uh, verbally abusive to me, um, very controlling. My dad had bipolar. <clears throat> then in um, high school, I got an eating disorder from the time I was 15 years old to 23 years old. I felt like um, I could control that part of my life. I got down to 100 pounds. I was five foot seven tall and was anorexic. Um, I didn't have a period for nine months, and the doctor said um, my body shut down the reproductive system to use that blood to pump my heart so I wouldn't die. So the enemy was trying to take me out. He can't. Yeah. <sighs> When I was 16 years old, um, I had a bad, and would go to bed, a spirit of fear would come into the Bible under your pillow, because that's all she knew, and cry out to Jesus in your mind to help you, to get that off of you, because I couldn't speak. And every time I would do that, the Lord would deliver me, and he'd get this awful spirit off of me, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Um, when I was 23 years old, um, I wanted to be set free from that uh, eating disorder. I watched the 700 Club, and I wasn't even saved yet. And yet I prayed that the Lord would set me free and do a miracle in my life. And he did. He set me free on the spot. I never had that problem ever again. Praise God. 
Um, I was working at the salon that I'm still working at not now at salon that I'm still working at not now at Great Clips at 25, and the Lord sent in a spirit-filled assistant manager to be assistant manager with me. Her name was Pat, and um, I had her fooled that I was a Christian because I give glory to God, I pray, but you know I wasn't going to church, wasn't reading my Bible. She didn't know that, but so she offered to come to my house uh, after we worked eight hours at this busy salon every day for two hours and do Bible study with me. I had so many questions for her that we couldn't get through the Bible study. <laughs> um, she told me to watch the Believer's Voice of Victory, Kenneth and Gloria Copeland Ministries, uh, daily on TBN, and I did. And I bowed my head in my own home and said the salvation prayer with Gloria and Kenneth Copeland. That was May 24th of 1994. I jumped in full body into the Lord and his word. God gave me many supernatural experiences. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. And I definitely believe that. On August 4th, 1994, I became spirit-filled. After I was born again, I felt so good. I thought, wow, you know, it feels so good to have Jesus in your heart. People talk about that, but man, I feel so good. And I thought, wow, Jesus is living in my heart. One night I was up late with my mom talking to her and she says you know after nine years your dad has finally forgiven you and enjoys being around you and after she said that wisdom just slammed me right between my my head my head and my eyes and the lord spoke to my heart and he said kimberly i cared you a manic depressive disorder when you asked jesus in your heart and i said lord thank you but why would you do this for me i didn't even know i had bipolar the Lord said, Kimberly, you wouldn't know who I really am if you were wrapped up in a mental disorder and you couldn't glorify me the way you do now. I had to remove it from you so that you could serve me. Isn't he an awesome God? So I was not only saved on the spot, but I was delivered on the spot of bipolar just because the Lord knew he had to take that off of me. Um, my husband didn't get saved yet, so that's been my cross to bear. We've been married um, 35 years on March 20th, so that's been a long haul for me. But God's promised, and he's faithful. So, My own home has been my training ground for um, spiritual warfare. Uh, my last pastor taught me spiritual warfare, and I, and I am the spiritual head of my home in Jesus' name. And I am victorious over the enemy and all of all his demons. I know my identity in Christ. Praise the Lord, the Most High God. After I got saved, um, my parents, you know, love covers a multitude of sin, 1 Peter 4, 8, and 1 John 4, 18, perfect love cast out fear. My parents came back to the Lord. Praise the Lord, the Most High God. They told me they were sorry for how they treated me, um, and they're the God of the turn. God is the God of the turnaround. They respected me. They told me that they were thankful to God for the woman that God has turned me out to be in Christ Jesus. They received the teachings and the scriptures, and they loved me to pray over them. Um, I had very good closure with my parents before they went to heaven. So I'm just so thankful to that and for the Lord for giving me that. Um. 1 Corinthians 15, 57 says, Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world, Satan, every plan, every scheme, every assignment of the enemy and his demons. And this is the victory that overcomes over the world, even our faith. So the Lord miraculously healed me from autism, fear, confusion, migraine headaches, eating disorder, and bipolar um, the Lord now has made me a prayer warrior, an intercessor, a worshiper of the Lord Jesus Christ, a word of faith Christian. I have a heart and a desire to see people delivered, healed, trained from whatever the enemy has bound them in, so they too can be set free from our miracle-working God. In Jesus' name. Be awesome stuff. Pretty awesome when you get to know people and, and admire their faith and, and uh, love for Jesus and to hear what they've come from, the things that they've had, had to overcome. It's just beautiful to see you, Kimberly, today, just so uh, powerful in the Lord, and yet, and, but I've never known you were, like, hampered by fear. 
Wow. So this is good for us. This is good for you to be heard, and it's good for us to hear the, the work of uh, Jesus Christ in life. So we're going to continue to do this uh, as we go through the series. We're going to dip into the new, new year, and uh, we're going to go through testimonies, testimonies and, and stories. And, and so if you're here and you would like to tell your story at some, time, uh, some, some point, uh, let us know, and we would love to plug you into the rotation. All right, so if you have your Bibles, uh, as we... Uh, Look to finish up our time together. I want you to open up the Bible uh, to Mark chapter 3. We are in this series called Amazing Jesus. Uh, we're going to go through uh, the rest of this month, and then we're going to get into, can you believe it's November already? And the colors are just in full bloom. Wow. So this, this shirt today is in celebration of my favorite autumn color, red. I love what's going on. So we're going to finish out this month. Uh, in the Gospel of Mark, and then we'll pick it back up in January. So Mark chapter 3 today, uh, today I want to talk to you about a, a concept called soul care. It's a little bit uh, similar to self-care. Self-care sounds a little hokey or selfish, but uh, I like the term self-care, but soul care is even maybe even a better term uh, to call this whole thing of just caring for your soul. Uh, soul uh, usually uh, refers to your mind, intellect, emotions. Uh, but honestly, I would like to say it includes your body and your spirit, your whole being. Uh, the word soul comes from the Hebrew word nephesh, which you can't parse it out so cleanly as just mind, intellect, and emotions. It's, it's your whole self. It embodies your whole being. So today I want to talk about how to tend to your soul, tend to your being, so that you are a functioning and healthy individual because we have responsibilities uh, to be about, and we got to be, be sure that we're taking good care of ourselves. But I'm uh, here to tell you that living in the information age provides some real peril to our souls. This thing right here is your greatest ally and your greatest enemy. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, bear into this a little bit today, so I hope I'm not stepping on toes, but I kind of hope I am too. Uh, you know, being a part of the age that we're in, we have so much information at our disposal. It's incredible the things that we can just pick up and, and speak into our phone, and it gives us the answer. Whatever you want to figure out, you have it in your pocket. Back in the day, they weren't able to do stuff like that. They'd have to go to the library, scour encyclopedias, and all these kinds of things. Man, we have it at our fingertips in this information age. So I read somewhere that the, the average uh, American has about 80 apps downloaded on their phone. 80. And I thought, there's no way. That's a lot. And I, I uh, tend to see myself as a minimalist. I, I actually have turned my smartphone into a dumb phone. <laughs> I've taken all the stuff off that I don't need on there. I have no social media on here. Because believe me, in times past, I was stuck on social media media. And any time that, you know, you're out and about, you get like fidgety fingers. So you got to take out the phone and start checking, start checking, start checking and scrolling. You ever get on the, what they call the death scroll? <laughs> you can't just stop scrolling. Scrolling, it's just, you know, there's so much features and interest points. And so anyhow, I, I've, I've had to scale this down. And so I, I, I like to see myself as a minimalist. And, and so I, I, I read 80 apps. And so I, I went Opened my phone, and I counted all the apps I have downloaded. I have 63. Still a lot. And if you were to count your apps, don't do it right now, you would probably find yourself more than you expected. So we have uh, been bombarded with options, and we have all kinds of things to check. Right? So we can check our news. We can check the news. Uh, we can check social media. We can check our texts. We can check our emails. Anytime you have any downtime, you can check your calendar. You can check the weather. You can check online orders, Groupons. Are you with me? Uh, you can listen to music. Yeah. You can listen to music. Uh, you can listen to an audio uh, book. You can listen to a podcast. You can watch a movie. You can play a game. I mean, we've got so many options sitting in our pocket all the time. 
And, uh, and then, then whatever you do, you have the constant notifications that are popping up and notifying you of this and that. And so you hear your phone vibrate or ding, and, and immediately you got to rush. Or if it rings, I got my kids running upstairs to get my phone. I don't need the phone. <laughs> Leave a message. You know, but some, somebody's always calling, something's always calling, let's say, demanding our attention. It's like living in a house with 80 rooms. Having a phone with 80 apps is like living in a house with 80 rooms, and you're checking all the rooms. <laughs> and all the rooms are connected with doors. I mean, you don't have to go back to the hallway, and pretty soon you forgot why you went to the house. You pick up your phone and you figure out, why did I pick up my phone? Because you've spent 30 minutes doing nothing. <clears throat> and this is absolutely destroying our ability to focus. I've heard it said some spiritual um, people who, who do this kind of spiritual formation talk about, you know, distraction is the curse of our age. We're completely and thoroughly distracted. So half the time we're thin and we're frazzled, right? It's, it's, it's too much. Our brains aren't wired to be constantly wired. We need to figure out how to organize our lives to be present. Present to God and present to those that he has placed in our life. Because half the time we're mentally someplace else. And it's no wonder we're having such an epidemic of mental health issues. Young people who are on these things, I mean, just it's addictive, right? It's, it's a hit of dopamine. You, it's, it's a ding and all these, it's, it's just discovery. It's constant discovery. And, and it's, it's constant stimulation. And, and our brains weren't wired for it. And so we've got to figure out how to be able to organize our lives and organize our thoughts, organize our time to be present, to be rooted in the moment and to be present to God and others. And then you add all the responsibilities of life under this information age. We still got jobs, we still got families, we still got friends, we've got to check in with people, we got to do our responsibilities, we got families to take care of, houses to take care of, we got cares and we got concerns. So it's no wonder sometimes we can't turn our brain off at night. Are you with me? Sometimes I, I, sometimes I have suffered from insomnia because I got too much going on. And so we got to dial it down. Our souls can get crowded in the 21st century. All these distractions, all these, these, these bells and whistles, man, they can crowd our soul. So... Um, Jesus, when he walked the earth, he had, he had something very similar happening. He had crowds to deal with. Jesus had his crowds. We got our crowds today, but Jesus had his crowds back then. And that was one of the characteristic features of his ministry. There was crowds, demands, people pulling and tugging and, 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 and demanding his attention. 123 times, it says, in the, uh, in the, in the Gospels, he dealt with the crowds. He was surrounded by it. And so Jesus was very intentional, though, as you go through the Gospels, in the way he dealt with his soul being crowded. And today I want us, as we go through this passage, it's going to be Mark chapter 3, verses 9, 7 through 19. Uh, I want us to observe the Master organize his life. He had demands just like you and I do, but it's going to help us to, to watch the Master because that's what discipleship's all about. We're observing the Master, figuring out how he does the things. And so when you're an apprentice, you got to follow around a journeyman. Let Jesus today be our journeyman and watch him, how he goes about his life. And I want us to be able to pick up some, some, uh, some points, some tips. Okay, so Mark chapter 7, we're going to see his intentionality with dealing with crowds. What did I say? 
chapter 3, verse 7, sorry. Chapter 3, verse 7 through 19. I want us to watch the intentionality of Jesus Christ. Okay, verse 7, chapter 3 says, Jesus withdrew. Say that with me. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea. And a great crowd followed him from, and I got a slide up here. I want you to look at this just to get, just to get a, a visual, okay? He's, he's down by the sea. This is Sea of Galilee, okay? And it said here that the, a great crowd followed him from Galilee, okay? So that's the region where he was ministering primarily in these fir first chapters of Mark. And a crowd came from Judea. And from Jerusalem, which is, which is the capital of Judea. And Idumea, which is further south. And then from beyond the Jordan, which is a region way over there. And from Tyre and from Sidon. They converge from all directions of the map. He's trying to get a have a getaway with his disciples and the whole country yeah. is searching him out, calling for his attention. When the great crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to Jesus. And he's told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest they crush him. For he had healed many so that all who had diseases pressed around him to touch him. And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, demonic forces, they fell down before him, people who were like possessed of demonic forces, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God! And he strictly ordered them not to make him known. And he went up to the mountain. And he called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. Not hundreds, not thousands. Verse 14 says, and he appointed 12. 12, whom he had also named apostles, so that they might, listen to this, be with him, and he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. And he appointed the 12, Simon to whom he, whom he called Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Boanerges, that is, sons of thunder. That's what, that was their nickname. Andrew, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, who we know later betrayed. You know, one of the Fascinating things about Jesus, one of the amazing things about Jesus, that's what this series is called, right? Amazing Jesus. I think this, this piece right here is one of the most amazing things, is that he was never in a hurry. Can you recall the time when you're reading the gospel where Jesus was ever rushed? He had all these demands, all these things to do, all these demands and, and people trying to get attention, and yet he was just never in a hurry. I want to be like that. Having surrounded with all the information and the, the, the no, bell, bells, whistles, and notifications, and people now, just to not ever have to be rushed. Wouldn't that be nice? Brenda's letting it sink in. Inhaling, inhaling the word. <laughs> he was as cool as a cucumber. I mean, he was calm. He was collected. I want to be like that. I want that life. I want the life. And I'm sure we look at Jesus and we say, I want that life. But John Mark Comer, um, in his book, Ruthless Elimination Hurry, has said, having the life of Jesus, we all want to say, I, I want that life. But having the life of Jesus requires having the lifestyle of Jesus. 
Do we, do we want the life of Jesus? Well, it's going to require us to, to observe the lifestyle that undergirds the ability to have that life. So discipleship is for us, for us, discipleship is watching the lifestyle of Jesus, not just wanting that kind of life. I want the fruit, but you got to have the root that makes it possible. And the lifestyle is, is what makes that life possible. You want to be cool? You want to collect it? You want to have composure and peace of mind and not to be thin and frazzled? Then it's going to require us to have the lifestyle of Jesus. So today we're going to, we're going to kind of observe his lifestyle. Because that's what discipleship is all about. I'm going to watch how he's doing life. And if you'll study his life, you'll see a consistent practice of disengagement. Now, Jesus was engaged. He was fully engaged. He cared about people. He cared about issues. He was engaged, but not, not 100% of the time. And, and, and if we, if there's, there's always something calling for our attention and we don't have a day to spare, I would say we're doing too much. Do you have any holes in your calendar? Are you so busy? Then perhaps you're doing too much and you're not following the pattern, the lifestyle of Jesus. If he withdrew, this was the first thing we see him. Jesus withdrew. Do you ever pull back? Do you ever disengage? And so today we're going to look at some principles for us to practice this principle, this uh, this habit of disengagement. I believe this passage will encourage us to value three things. Being alone with Jesus. Hello? Being hidden with Jesus and then getting reconnected with Jesus. So, we'll see that Jesus makes three escapes in this passage. He escaped. The crowds were coming and converging and following him, and yet he's escaping. And he's making these escapes. Do you have exit strategies? <laughs> you, you need to figure out how to escape and disengage and withdraw. You can't always, 100% of the time, be engaged. You've got you to pull back. Intentional. Being intentional about it. So his first escape, as you see here in verse 7, was out to the sea. Jesus, see it again with me, withdrew. Jesus withdrew. And it's okay to withdraw. He withdrew with his disciples. We need to be able to withdraw, withdraw with Jesus. Are we his disciples? Then we need to be able to withdraw with Jesus. To the sea. Wouldn't that be just fun? Ah, oh, go out to seaside with Jesus? Just get out of Dodge. You know, I know some of you guys have taken time, and, and I can tell, you know, when you get away and, and, and get disengaged, it just restores and revitalizes something in your soul because you're just too thin. So this should help us value getting along with Jesus. I think often uh, Jesus is pulling back. And he expects us to pull back with him. I was sitting at my desk on Monday working, and, and I love to work. I love to just and get engaged and get stuff done. I love to have to-do lists and, and, and to accomplish my, my tasks. And I was sitting at my desk, and it was Monday morning. Just got seated, right? And here I am. I, hear, I, have, I have this vague feeling that Jesus wants me to pray. I don't have time for that right now. <laughs> Am I the only one? You have a vague feeling that you need to be praying. And, just to, and I felt like he wanted, to, wanted me to, to go off and, and, and pray. And I'm like, nah, just a little, maybe this afternoon. Let me just get this done first. You know what ha happened next? My internet went out. <laughs> yeah. All right. And I still fought it. 
I'm in the I'm in the moment. I hate shifting gears. That's one thing about me. I'm not I'm not good. I'm not, not I'm not a good multitasker. If I'm doing something, I'm in gear. And I don't want to shift the gear. And so I just didn't want to shift. I see here I am. I'm pressing on. I'm pressing on. And I feel like, okay, it's, it's nagging me. The internet went out. He's getting my attention. And so I went ahead and pulled aside and did some quiet time with Jesus. Monday morning, when things were just getting going, and it was good for my soul. I enjoyed it. Anybody else have work workaholic tendencies? They need to be curbed in order to tend to our souls. We're surrounded by an American culture that just expects more and more and more. It's so demanding, and so you've got to get out ahead of the scene and make sure that it doesn't take over. Jesus was feeling pressure of the crowd, and, and he said, hey, I, I, need, I need a day off. And so it's in, important for us to have what I call mental health days. We got sick leave. You, 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 why do I always take sick leave on the back end when you, you've wrecked something and your, your health is, is bad because you're just going too much? Why don't we put that on the front end and have once in a while a mental health, take a mental health day. Come on. Yeah. Amen. I'm preaching now. <laughs> Take a day off. Work it into your schedule. Talk to your supervisors. Whatever it takes. Take, be, put it on the front end of stuff. We, we pay off all these health issues, and medicine and all this stuff, and surgeries because maybe we've, we've and sometimes things happen even when you take care of yourself. And I'm not saying that. <laughs> But sometimes that stuff happens because we just haven't taken care of ourselves on the front end. And I think it's important for us to recognize we need to take a break. Or better yet, take some form of solitude every day. Right? Here's a good practice to follow. I want you to throw up that next slide. Divert daily. If you want to stay healthy, divert daily. Withdraw Weekly and abandon yearly. You should have a, a time where you're taking a vacation. And I'm not just talking about vacation, but I'm talking about, why don't you throw up that next slide? Doing it with Jesus. This isn't just like, hey, I need time for myself. I need to pull away. I need to disengage. No, the whole purpose of this whole thing is that you would spend that time. A daily time. Some people call it a quiet time, but whatever you call it, take a time. I take a walk. I go out in the fresh air and get circulation. And I talk and I listen. I'm very intentional. And I take a walk. That helps me. Uh, withdraw weekly. That's like, I would call that a Sabbath. Okay, we don't need to be legalistic about it, but take a day where you can rest do you know the first full day of Adam and Eve's existence? It was the first full day was Sabbath. They spent the whole day with God. And then out of that rest, they rose to meet the week. I think we should have a time when we're just having a day of rest weekly. So every day. Maybe an hour with the Lord. What, every week, maybe a day, a half a day at least. And then every year, abandon. Pull away, not just vacation, but just a time to spend time with Jesus. If that's a weekend away, take your journal. Get recharged. Get refreshed. Hear his word sp spoken to you. And being alone with Jesus includes unplugging from technology. Don't bring this with you. Your time said, Jesus, leave this back somewhere else. They say this today, you know, and we don't have this with us. Our, our, our fingers get kind of itchy and we got because we got this checking habit. You know, they're calling this the new cigarette. <laughs> this is like your pack of cigarettes. You know, you, 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 you're sitting in, 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 in bed scrolling. It's like just, it's like chain, chain smoking in bed. 
It's a funny image, huh? But it's, it's, it's an image worth contemplating. It's addictive. And sometimes I'm spending on my death scroll nearly an hour because it's just dopamine hit, dopamine hit, dopamine hit, dopamine hit, dopamine hit, and then I'm, I'm just, and then all the blue light doesn't allow me to go to sleep. Like I said, it's great, your greatest friend. I'm not knocking this. There's a lot to this that I love having, but we've got to make sure it's not turning into a destructive habit. So Jesus had a plan, and we can see it here in verse 9. People came looking, people came calling. When you get along, alone with Jesus, uh, you got to have a plan for when this happens. Verse 9 says, he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him. Because he knew the time he disengages, he pulls away, something's going to call, something's going to demand. And so he said, hey, have a boat ready for, for me. Because of the crowd, lest they crush me. It's interesting here in verse 10, he says, For he, had, he healed many, so that all who had diseases pressed around him to touch him. And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. And he strictly ordered them not to make them known. So much commotion, so much hubbub, so much activity, so much attention, and he didn't actually like it. This was the wrong kind of attention. So we're talking about being alone with Jesus. Now we're going to be talking about being hidden with Jesus. Jesus liked to keep things on the down low. He didn't like a lot of the, uh, the press of the crowd. He didn't like the wrong kind of attention. So it's his second escape. His first escape was to the sea. Second escape was out to the boat so he wouldn't be crushed. Very human thing to say. Jesus was concerned about being crushed. Our souls can be crushed by too much crowding. And we need to be honest with the fact that I, this, is, this is not good for my soul. A 24-7 news cycle. We know all the tragedies. We know all the disasters. We have a very small world that I don't think we were equipped to have so much omniscience. We have to know everything. Did you hear? Did you hear? Did you hear? No, I didn't hear. And I don't want to. I can't handle it. I can't handle one more disaster. I wasn't wired for that. I don't need to know everything. And then the wrong kind of attention, especially too much of it. He strictly orders the demon to not make him or the, the man or the, the people around that situation, don't, don't say that to everybody. I know the timing wasn't right, but I don't think that was the right kind of attention. And it's good for us to, to realize I don't need all the fanfare. It's not good for my soul. Paul says to the Thessalonians, make it your ambition to live a quiet life. I can live a quiet... You know, when I was growing up, I wanted to be famous. Looking at these people, it's like sports stars, and I could do that. Just streaming the limelight, and oh, man, I could do that. I don't think I would have been able to do that. God has gifted me with the gift of obscurity. Nobody knows who I am. And that's good for my soul. I'm okay with that. I think Jesus knew that this wasn't good for his soul. This kind of attention is the wrong kind of attention. These, these crowds are just here to, to, to get and to, and to see spectacles. And, and, and although he was engaged, he knew that he needed to disengage because this, this kind of attention was not good. So one time, Eugene Peterson, one of my favorite authors, uh, loved to talk about Eugene Peterson. Uh, but he was uh, invited to speak at an engagement of 40,000 people. And so he was kind of hemming and hawing about the thing. And, and so his son, Eric, uh, said, Dad, why, what's, the, what's the deal? I mean, you're, you're Eugene Peterson. I mean, you've got a message that the world needs to have. And Eric said, 
what his dad said will haunt him for the rest of his life. He said, son, I'm afraid of losing my soul. And I thought, wow, a man who is in touch with his weaknesses. I think he was saying, hey, I, I don't want any notions of self-grandeur. I don't want the wrong kinds of attention. I don't want an overinflated sense of self. I don't need to know that I'm all that. Because I'm not. But they're telling me that I am. And, and so just to be reticent, just a bit of reticence, I think is a, is a good caution for us. I'd rather be a nobody, nobody and be with Jesus than as somebody and be far from him. You know, this, this celebrity culture that we have. I mean, you're not anybody until you're a celebrity. No, reject that. You, are, you're, you have identity, and that identity doesn't come from the crowd. It doesn't come from attention. It comes from who you are in Jesus Christ. It doesn't even come from what you do. That's right. You know, we're not human doings. We're human beings. So be who you are. Your value, your identity is already innately and intrinsically belongs to you. It doesn't come from anything else. Keep your feet on the ground. We don't, you don't need anybody to pat you on the back or to validate you. You are who you are by the grace of God. Enjoy it. Obscurity keeps our heart in the right place. Because if you think about it, that's where Jesus is. He lived 90% of his life in obscurity. Let that sink in. Three and a half years of crowds and all this hustle and bustle and all that wasn't the greatest attention. <laughs> but yet 90% of his life was li lived in a family, in a little carpenter shop, and nobody knew who he was. Jesus! So Jesus loved to disengage. First escape was out to the sea. Second escape was out on a boat. And in this passage, we see a third, a third escape, and that was up on a mountain. He went up on a mountain, verse 13. He went up on a mountain and called to him those who he desired, and they came to him. And check this out, verse 14. He appointed 12 whom he also named apostles so that they might, number one, be with him. And that he might, number two, send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. I think this helps us uh, value the, 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 the principle of disengagement is to be reconnected with Jesus. We all need to be reconnected with the Master. It's kind of like a, a, it's like a, it's like a bow and arrow. A bow and arrow, think about it. When, it when, it's, when, when Jesus pulls back and he's pulling you back, right, it's that string that comes back and, and, and at the further you pull back, the further you disengage, he will take your life and aim you into the direction you need to be and he will release you into his purposes. This isn't just like, hey, I need to have more time for self. This is I need to get by myself. This is I need to isolate myself. Not necessarily that. This is not that. This is disengaging for the, for the purpose of getting reconnected with your purpose and God's plan for your life, and he will release you into his purposes. We ultimately want to be engaged. We got people, we got needs around, we got family, we got responsibilities. We want to be really engaged, but we can't do it 100% of the time. We got to be, we got to pull back with Jesus. And the further you do it, uh, you are launched into his purposes and plan. But he's got to aim your life. He, he's got to, he's not going to, he's not trying to dissipate your energy. He's trying to localize or focus your energy into a direction. But you got to get that direction. That only happens when you pull back. And he'll aim. And he'll put you right into the place you need to be. 
We're going to take communion today. So if you haven't received the cup, the bread and the juice, feel free to lift your hand. I haven't received one if I'll take that in. Hallelujah. I want to talk to those who have trouble pulling back. Pulling back from the grind of life, the grind of everyday life. It's hard to pull back. And I'm one of them. I'm with you. You don't get along with Jesus like you want to. You don't lay low like you should. You're busy. Your soul is crowded. You're recognizing I'm thin. I'm starting to become frazzled. Let me encourage you. The principles of the kingdom are counterintuitive. Can I say less is more? Less is more. If you want to have more, it's not more. It's less. That's what it looks like. To pull away. To be with Jesus. To be alone with Jesus. To be even to be hidden with Jesus. When you think you have a gift, a purpose, a plan, Why isn't this X, Y, or Z happening in my life? I feel like I'm just pining away in obscurity. Oh, don't don't miss it. If you're with Jesus, you're, you're right where you need to be. So getting alone with Jesus, being hidden with Jesus, it's all reconnecting with Jesus. We think... You can't get ahead by pulling back. You can't get things done by disengaging, going off to pray. You can't win by losing, and you can't live by dying, and the cross proves us wrong. Jesus disengaged into death bring about the greatest victory this universe has ever seen look like defeat died a criminal's death what was that all about in a tomb done and out of that tomb what was 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 it, it, it was like the womb of a brand new reality no one, had, no one had ever conceived of. And so when God draws you back into a place, oh, that might be the best place. It might be alone. It might be hidden. It might be obscure. And God has you right where he wants you. If you're with him. Today is a celebration of that counterintuitive nature of the kingdom of Jesus. He is king. King of kings, Lord of lords, but it it came about because he laid it all down. He emptied himself of all divine prerogative and came as a man, served as a man, died a death that only a criminal should should have died, all because he wanted to bring about the greatest victory the world has ever seen. Now he is exalted above every name. Every name, every tongue, every knee, every, it, all the universe will recognize Jesus as being King of Kings, Lord of Lords, because of his broken body, spilt blood. He's done it for you and me. The body represents, or the bread, I should say, it represents the body that was broken on our behalf. The wages of sin is death. What he did should have happened to us. His blood is the the, the promise in the new covenant. And the promise is forgiveness of sins. That he has cleansed us. 
Our sins have been cleansed. We have been made righteous. So when you stand before the Father, you are holy and you are righteous. Not because of you achieving it. Jesus already did that for you. And you get to stand with His righteousness. Commendation. Love and acceptance of the Father because of His great work in our life. So Lord, thank you for coming, showing us the way. And I pray that we too will see the counterintuitive nature of your kingdom. We take the bread, we take the juice now as emblems of your life to us.